Hello, everyone. Hello from San Francisco, and welcome to WCN's Wildlife Conservation Expo. Thanks for tuning in today. My name is Paul Thompson. I'm WCN's Director of Conservation Programs, and I'm really happy to present today's session. Now, you can't have a day-long run of wildlife talks without a conversation about COVID-19. It's the reason our expo is virtual today. It's the reason we are all in our homes. And given the linkages to wildlife and trade, it's clearly a really important issue that we want to cover. And I know that we all have a lot of questions about COVID-19 and the crisis that's resulted from it. So today in this session, we're going to be hearing things like, how do diseases spill over from animals to people? And what do we mean when we talk about wildlife trade? And how do these wildlife markets actually work? And importantly, what can we do to prevent the next pandemic? So all collective efforts are needed in order to prevent the future calamity. Now, I think this crisis has really given us an opportunity to reflect on a bunch of different aspects of our lives. So ultimately, we wanted to put together a session that was about our very relationship with nature. So before I introduce all of today's panelists, I just wanna run through how this is going to work in case you're tuning in for the first time, and this is a new format for all of us. So now as a reminder, you can see and hear us, but we cannot see or hear you. Um, so during the session, if you do have questions or if you do have comments, please leave them in the chat feature, which is to the right of the video screen. Um, each panelist will come on screen and give a short presentation, and then all of us will come back towards the end for an interactive discussion and take some questions from the audience. So now it's my extreme honor to present today's guests. First, we will hear from Dr. Kirsten Gillardi, who is Executive Director of Gorilla Doctors and Co-Director at UC Davis's Wildlife Health Center. Now, Kristen's work is really at the nexus between veterinary medicine and wildlife conservation. Kirsten's joining us from Davis, California. Then we'll hear from Mary Rice, the Executive Director of the Environmental Investigation Agency. Mary and her team conduct undercover investigations into wildlife crime and the global wildlife trade. Mary is joining us from the UK. Then we'll hear from John Baker, who's Chief Program Officer with WildAid. WildAid are masters of campaigns in China, Vietnam, throughout Asia, and even into Africa now. Um, they raise awareness and drive behavior change for improved wildlife conservation and policy. And John is joining us today from San Francisco. And then last but certainly not least, I'm delighted to say our discussion moderator is renowned science journalist David Quammen who has written extensively in publications. You've probably read many of his articles in National Geographic. He's written a number of incredible books, including Song of the Dodo and the very prescient 2012 spillover, Animal Infections and the Next Human Pandemic. David is joining us from Bozeman, Montana. So first up, I'd like to welcome to the stage or the screen, Dr. Kirsten Gillardi who is again from Gorilla Doctors and will be speaking on uh, the origins of this epidemic and zoonotics. Kirsten, once we see your video in a couple seconds, we will kick it over to you. Hi there, can you see me? Not yet, uh, we can hear you, but perhaps your video is coming on in a second. It may be that your video has turned off, but if you want to see, here we go. Okay. A little tech bump here and there is perfectly fine. Everybody's very accommodating. Um, Kirsten, if you just want to go ahead and get started and we can sort okay, of sure. figure out the visuals. All right. All right. Um, I'll leave it to you. All right. I hope everyone can see me, but um, good morning or good afternoon. And I think where I'd like to start this morning is to talk about zoonotic disease. And these are diseases that are caused by pathogens like bacteria and viruses 
um, that originate in animals. Rabies, Lyme disease, influenza, these are all zoonotic diseases. And it's actually quite remarkable to consider the fact that um, more than half of infectious diseases in humans are zoonotic. This is really a reflection of the really incredibly important role that animals have played um, and continue to play in our evolution as humans. As a species, we need animals for food, we need them for labor, and we need them for our emotional well being as humans. Um, at this point today, we don't have the scientific proof that SARS coronavirus 2, the virus that causes COVID 19, is zoonotic, but we have a lot of scientific evidence. Um, an abundance of scientific evidence to suggest that it probably is because it's very closely related genetically to other coronaviruses that we know have made the jump from, from animals to people, like the first SARS coronavirus um, in the early 2000s that caused a human outbreak. So not only is COVID-19 uh, likely a zoonotic disease, but we also call COVID-19 um, an emerging infectious disease or an EID. Um, because until two, December 2019, no one had ever isolated this virus in a patient or in an animal or even in the wild. And I mentioned the wild because it turns out that the majority of in emerging infectious diseases are of wildlife origin. For example, that first SARS coronavirus I mentioned earlier uh, was found to be circulating in perfectly healthy horseshoe bats in caves in China. And um, many of you, all of you probably heard of Ebola virus, um, which emerged in the 1970s. Um, and uh, since and has since killed many thousands of people in numerous outbreaks in Africa. And it belongs to a whole family of viruses called the phyloviruses, um, which are carried by bats. Why bats? Um, it's partly because bats are such, uh, are among the oldest animals on earth, and they have had literally tens of millions of years to co-evolve with pathogens like viruses to a point now where they can carry those viruses, um, that those viruses simply live in the bats, but they don't make the bats themselves sick. So talked about the concept of zoonotic disease and emerging infectious disease. And now I want to just talk briefly about the concept of spillover, which is this event that it's a term we use to describe the event when a virus or a, path, a pathogen like a virus carried by one species makes the sudden jump to infect a whole new host species like people. And the fact is that wildlife spillovers are happening more and more frequently because more and more people are coming into ever closer direct contact with wild animals as people encroach into wildlife habitat, for example, to cut forests down to make way for crops or to people are hunting wildlife to feed their families or successful hunters are bringing their uh, bushmeat to markets or selling to customers. This kind of close direct contact is bringing people and wildlife uh, into contact um, at a scale that's um, never before been seen on the planet. And so that's that's scary stuff for sure. And in the face of this COVID-19 pandemic, when the world is anxious and our lives have been turned upside down, um, the challenge for those of us working in wildlife con conservation is to really try to really help inspire people to take positive action now and in the future. And so what I mean here is that this emer emerging infectious diseases like COVID can help remind us how important it is to maintain habitats for wildlife that are separate from the land we need for human communities and for agriculture. agriculture. I mean, we know that habitat destruction is directly correlated to um, the increase for uh, spillover events happening. Um, emerging infectious diseases like COVID-19 also remind us of how critically important it is that wildlife, that, that what a critically important role wildlife play um, in providing essential services um, like food and uh, like food production. Um, if you think about it, it would be so easy right now for bats to be absolutely vilified, but we have to remind people that bats are incredibly important as insectivores and pollinators. One bat can eat several thousand insects in one night, so that's several thousand fewer mosquitoes that could be carrying the ma malaria parasite. Um, so we need bats, we need, and we need to figure out how to live safely with them in our world. And the other challenging, the other challenge for those of us working in wildlife conservation right now is to minimize the potential for emerging infectious diseases to impact wildlife because spillover can actually go both ways. Humans can make wildlife sick too. Um, if we were all in, um, I, I'm sorry, you still can't see me. I don't have any indication that my camera is off or on. I'll try again. Um, if we were together in a room when they are injured, caught in a snare, or they're ill, 
Um, and the forests are actually where we they are literally our hospitals. Our veterinarians, if a mongrel is sick or injured, our veterinarians take all of the equipment and supplies they need um, to take care of those gorillas right in the forest. Uh, we don't separate gorillas from their families. But um, this the habituation, which allows us to do our work and allows these girls to be protected, is a is a double edged sword because we get um, because getting so close to gorillas means that um, we have the opportunity, the potential to give um, those gorillas and and other great apes truly um, the pathogens that are infectious for people because gorillas and other great apes are susceptible to human pathogens. And so this brings us back to COVID-19. Uh, while we don't know if gorillas are susceptible to COVID, we know that they're susceptible to other human respiratory pathogens. So the safest thing for us is to assume that they could also catch this virus. And so our task is to minimize the risk of transmission, just like what we humans are doing all over the world right now um, for ourselves and our communities. Um, in fact, gorilla doctors and our park partners um, have always practiced and promoted the very same measures we humans are taking now with COVID. And to protect the health of gorillas, we practice good hygiene. We don't work with the gorillas when they're sick. We maintain a safe distance from the gorillas when we're, when we're conducting our, our health checks and we wear face masks. So these preventative health measure, measures are now being strictly enforced by the parks where the mountain gorillas live. Knock wood, uh, we uh, have not seen COVID-19 in the gorillas yet. Um, we're keeping them safe from COVID-19. Um, if the virus should get into the population, we're ready to help them. So I'm gonna turn things over to Mary, talk more about this nexus between pandemics, people, and wildlife. Okay, thank you very much, Kirsten. Um, sorry we didn't see you, but it was a really interesting overview of what we're dealing with. Um, I've been asked to talk about the global, the legal global wildlife trade and the illegal wildlife trade. Um, the global wildlife trade is worth billions of dollars every year. Um, essentially, it's the commercial exploitation of wildlife for consumption as food, for perceived medicinal properties, for medical research, uh, pet trade, fur trade. Um, and also uh, for decoration, ivory bangles, tiger skin rugs, all sorts of things. Um, the illegal wildlife trade is also worth billions of dollars and is listed among the top four serious organized crimes alongside the illegal trade in narcotics, um, the illegal trade in firearms, and also human trafficking. Um, and I'm gonna talk broadly around the illegal wildlife trade because that is, is where our expertise at EIA is. Um, each year, we're seeing more and more threatened and endangered species entering the illegal wildlife trade. And from the most iconic, uh, some you already know, elephants, rhinos for their horns, tigers, leopards, jaguars, and other big cats, to lesser known species like helmeted hornbills and, and pangolins. And I include pangolins here because until very recently, most people did not know what a pangolin was. But sadly, the pangolin has now become the most illegally traded mammal on the um, And also in the context of the, the COVID um, virus, uh, a lot of these products do sometimes end up in wet markets. Uh, wet markets are typically open air markets that sell fresh meat and 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 seafood. Um, but illegal, illegal wildlife trade takes place through many, many other vehicles um, and platforms um, and is also laundered through legitimate markets. And I think all eyes have recently been focused recently on the wet market in China, which people are speculating was the origin of the coronavirus, but I think it's also really important to recognize that these markets are typical all over Southeast Asia and also in many other countries, including Africa. The illegal wildlife trade is perpetuated increasingly and perpetrated by transnational organized criminal networks. These networks operate across borders they are adaptive and sophisticated and multifaceted, and they will move the sourcing of their 
the the livestock or not the livestock but the the wildlife that they they are trying to get hold of according to the prevailing political and governance landscape and also according to the availability of the the, the wild animal thereafter they exploit weak governance and they foster corruption and they may also engage in other criminal activities EIA has been documenting and exposing the illegal wildlife trade now for almost four decades, um, monitoring changing dynamics and understanding the way that these criminals work. Um, and it, for example, over the last decade, we've seen a shift and an increase in the involvement of Vietnamese led networks. For example, when prior to that, it was largely Chinese led networks. And then as with any successful business enterprise, there is a hierarchy from the poacher who sources the product to the big boss who's at the end of the trade chain. Um, there are often discrete roles and responsibilities, uh, transporters, logisticians, specialist packers, who have developed unique and unexpected ways of concealing the contraband. And of course, there are corrupt officials, police and customs officers who've been groomed over time to in the source transit and consuming countries. Um, as a result of the coronavirus, China has currently placed a ban on the consumption of wildlife for food. Whether this becomes permanent remains to be seen. There's certainly been a lot of discussion around calls for the closure of wildlife markets. But I think it's really important to differentiate between commercial wildlife markets and those in places where indigenous communities rely on wildlife for subsistence. And in closing, I would add that tackling the illegal wildlife trade in its many and varied forms is not the only factor behind our increased vulnerability to future disease transmission. Current crisis provides us with an opportunity um, to recalibrate our relationship with the habitats that we rely on and the only home we have. And with that, I'm going to hand over to John, who will talk about um the way forward thank you mary i'm john baker from wild aid and i want to uh talk a bit about how campaigns and how we can use this uh moment we have now uh with the heightened awareness around the covid and the importance of addressing the wildlife trade first of all to prevent the next pandemic uh but also to maybe even help conserve some of these species that are being affected by the trade. As Mary mentioned, China has already announced some new regulations. Uh, we're waiting to see whether or not they will become permanent. We're expecting that these regulations will be quite an improvement on what we have seen in the past. And we expect perhaps by later this month, uh, Toward the end of May, we may hear some announcements from China on that. We have seen some previews of these draft regulations, and there are reasons to be optimistic that they will be uh, rather comprehensive. One question getting to Mary's point on pangolins is whether or not pangolins will be restricted from medical use, whether the scales will be prohibited from use by the medical industry in China. So that's an open question. Um, as Mary also mentioned, Vietnam has also uh, begun the process of drafting stronger regulations. And we're hopeful there as well that the government will imp improve those uh, prohibitions, including online sales of wildlife in Vietnam in particular, there's not as much of concern around markets. Those are not as common or uh, prevalent in terms of wildlife sales, but we are concerned mostly about these wildlife restaurants and we're focused on that. Other countries as well are in different stages of uh, developing regulations such as Indonesia, Malaysia, and other parts of Africa and Latin America. For example, Malawi has announced a ban on bushmeat, which is both the selling and consumption, which is also very important. 
And again, to reiterate what Mary said, uh, these measures are all very important. Uh, we are helping in many cases to promote these and help develop and advance them. But we are primarily focused on the commercial trade and urban consumption. There's no effort here uh, at this point in time to do any type of measures that would restrict uh, subsist subsistence access to wildlife especially uh, for indigenous groups and especially where food security concerns are, are, um, are paramount. So to summarize, I think we, we really need to focus on supporting government partners and developing stronger policies and more effective enforcement. We also uh, are helping to communicate to the public not only the risks of this virus, which are very well known in many places, such as China, where public opinion is very much surging. And this is really our opportunity now to solidify attitudes and behaviors around the consumption of wildlife and really make these permanent, socially unacceptable attitudes um, so that we do not see these behaviors uh, resume once the spotlight and the headlines have shifted. Uh, at the same time, we also need to monitor and trade, uh, the monitor and track the wildlife trade to make sure that these markets and the trade does not resume once, uh, you know, once the the spotlight has shifted on. I would like to uh, give a small uh, gesture of of our gratitude to the Wildlife Conservation Network and the Pangolin Crisis Fund. They provided a very generous lead gift to WildAid and for initiating this work in parts of Asia, China, and uh, Vietnam in particular, but we're also looking to get these programs going in other countries. I do believe it's really important that we work on a global response and we don't just isolate certain countries like China or Vietnam. And we show that this is a real, truly a global crisis that requires a global response. As part of that, we've joined a coalition with uh, Wild, Wildlife Conservation Society and Global Wildlife Conservation called End the Trade. You can find it online at endthetrade.com. We have a declaration that we've just put out this week. And I do think we also need to uh, be vigilant in uh, counteracting this narrative now about the origin of the virus coming from a lab. We need to uh, work with our scientists, colleagues to, to make sure the public is aware that this does come from wildlife trade and without addressing the wildlife trade around the world, we do risk the next pandemic. And on that note, I'd like to hand over to David, who I think has done so much work on documenting this around the world. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Juan. And thank you, WCN, for uh, inviting me to be part of this. Um, and Kirsten and Mary, thanks uh, for your thoughts on this. I'm going to add just a few things, and then we'll all talk together. One of the things I want to do is pick up on a, a couple of points that uh, that Kirsten made about these these events, these spillovers, the passage of some sort of a pathogen, uh, a virus or a bacterium or something else from a non-human animal into a human host. I think it's important for people to remember that um, these events are not new. Humans have been coming into contact with wild animals that we know for, you know, well, it, as long as we've been a species, whatever you, you mark that at 200,000 years. Uh, and, uh, and pathogens have pa been passing into humans for a long, long time too. The bubonic plagues of the, the 14th century uh, and, and other events. But something is different now. Something is very different in recent decades. And I would mark it as going back about six decades. There has been a drumbeat of spillovers from wild animals, non-human animals, into humans over that period of time. I think of uh, Mapucho virus, 1961. Marburg virus, 67. Ebola, the first outbreaks were recognized in 76. It was 1981 when we recognized that HIV was in the human population, although it had been there 
uh, we now know a long time. Um, a crazy virus called Hendra virus in Australia spilled over from bats in 94, Nipah virus 98, SARS 2003, et cetera, et cetera. These things have been happening with what seems to be greater uh, frequency and with greater consequences. And there are a few obvious uh, reasons for that, the increase in uh, this problem. And uh, the other panelists have talked about that a bit. Um, these things result from disruptive contact between humans and non-human animals. And that takes various different forms. Uh, the most obvious one is of course, capturing or killing animals for food, but there's also capturing uh, animals for medical purposes. That's what led to the Marburg spillover. Um, capturing animals for medicinal purposes. We'll talk some more about pangolins, I hope. Uh, disruption of habitat, invasion of habitat puts us in jeopardy of, of these new viruses. Um, and uh, conversion of habitat in some cases brings wild animals closer to us. I think of Hendra virus which, uh, and Nipah virus, which resulted from destruction of tropical forests that left uh, giant fruit bats looking for food in other places. And they started coming in closer to uh, human settlements, orchards, fruit trees planted over piggeries. In the case of Nipah virus, these various different uh, uh, mechanisms that, that trigger. But it all has one thing in common, and that is human uh, disruptive and invasive interaction with rich, diverse ecosystems, including the many, many uh, forms of animal that those ecosystems contain and all of those animals contain their own unique viruses. So as we disrupt the natural world more and more, now that there are 7.7 .7 billion of us humans, smart and hungry and uh, restless to irrigate resources to ourselves, these viruses that are carried in these uh, wild animals have more and more opportunities to make the crucial spillover into that first human host. And then if it turns out that they can replicate in the human host, um, the person becomes sick. And if they can transmit from one host to another, which is not always the case, for instance, rabies is a very important zoonotic virus, but it's almost unknown that it would pass from one human victim into another. Uh, but if it, the virus does, if the pathogen does transmit, then you have an outbreak, dozens or hundreds of cases in a particular area. If the outbreak spreads through a nation, you've got an epidemic. And if it spreads around the world, you've got a pandemic, which is what we have now. Um, and so what is the solution to that? Well, uh, we'll talk more about that too. Um, but I would say that we should think about this in terms of stages. Can we pre prevent viral spillovers in the future? It's unlikely. It's unlikely that we can prevent that um, with any degree of thoroughness. Can we prevent spillovers from turning into outbreaks? A little bit greater possibility if we have um, if we have intensive monitoring, internationally connected, close monitoring of human health, human infection, we can perhaps detect these things at the point of a spillover and affecting only a few dozen or a few hundred people. And then if we have networks of fast and effective public health measures and international cooperation at the governmental level, we can prevent outbreaks from turning into epidemics and epidemics turning into pandemics. We have the science. We have the technology. We need the public health investment and we need the political will to put that sort of thing in place before the next big one comes. And there will be another one after this. This is not the last big one. This is only the current big one that we're suffering through. So with that, uh, I'd like to welcome everybody back up here on stage with me on this virtual stage uh, and let's have a little bit of conversation. Can we do that now? All right, we're back. Um, I want to. I want to jump right in with one question. Uh, I suppose this is focused to um, to Mary and uh, and also to John. In terms of China, we now have a ban, as I understand it, on the um, the wildlife trade for food 
Uh, I'd like to understand more about that. Um, is it only for food? Does it also cover things like pangolin scales uh, for medicinal purposes? Um, is it likely to be permanent? And is it likely to be enforced? Okay, um, I'll, I'll start and John, you can jump in. Um, so the, the current ban is only on the consumption of wildlife meat. Um, it doesn't cover the use of pangolin scales in traditional Chinese medicine. And this is, this is what John alluded to when he was talking about the, the current review that's taking place in China with regard to their, their, their national legislation around this. Um, in terms of enforcement, um, I'll let John talk about the medicinal part, but in terms of enforcement, certainly from EIA's perspective, we've seen a much greater enforcement effort in China, um, particularly around sort of, sort of products coming into the country. In terms of what's happening on the ground, um, John may be better placed to answer that. So I'll hand over to John. Thanks, Mary. I would just add that, uh, as I said, we don't know about the medicinal use of pangolin scales. Obviously, it's a big issue, and I'm sure the government of China is very aware that um, obviously by permitting that trade, they're also uh, encouraging the, the supply chain and supply of pangolins from now mostly coming from Central and West Africa. In terms of enforcement, I have to say we've been very impressed in recent years with the extent and the, the effectiveness of China's enforcement on wildlife trade. So there are reasons to be hopeful in that regard. To stick with pangolins for just a second, um, we've heard that um, there have been one or two studies that came out early on that suggested that um, this, this particular coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2, was uh, a close match to a coronavirus in pangolins, as well as uh, a very close match to one in bats. And so there was some, there was some speculating about whether perhaps pangolins in, uh, in the in that particular one on wholesale seafood market in the city of Wuhan, perhaps pangolins had been an amplifier host for this um, for this spillover into humans. Part of that is because I think among the first 41 cases, 27 of those cases were directly linked to the to the market, and it's hard to imagine that if uh, the spillover came directly from a horseshoe bat, tiny little horseshoe bat, that it could have um, could have infected 27 people, whereas if it's a larger animal, uh, a little bit more um, possibility of that. Um, first of all, do, do any of the three of you have thoughts about that, about the pangolin hypothesis? Um, and, and secondly, if that story is in circulation, does it offer any prospect of discouragement or use of pangolins as food or, or, or medicine? Might, might the onus of the possibility of them having been a host, either a natural host or an amplifier host of the virus, does that offer any possibility of relief to them in terms of being captured and treated? Well, David, I'll speak to um, a little bit about the possibilities for penguins being the, the reservoir for this virus. You know, some of that early data was based on short sequences of the coronavirus that is, were isolated. And I think what we, as we all know, as we've done, we're doing more and more research on this virus um, and the pandemic and all the opportunity um, that gives us for learning more about it. We're, we're, we're better understanding how closely related it is to um, the SARS coronavirus that caused the first SARS outbreak that you mentioned also. Um, and that virus was isolated from horseshoe bats in caves in China. But if you'll recall in the first SARS outbreak, there was a lot of uh, finger pointing at civets, which were also live traded in the markets. And a very, very unfortunate um, outcome of that was that a lot of civets were killed because it was, uh, they thought they were doing humanity a favor by eliminating that species. And so, um, so I think it's incredibly important that we, we make sure we understand um, the, the total ecology of this virus before starting to make decisions about how best to, to control it. Uh, but the basic 
basic measure, the most important measure is eliminating that direct contact between the carrier of the virus and, and the susceptible host like people. And so um, you touched on it yourself. I mean, where people are coming into close contact with wildlife, um, those are all opportunities for viruses that are circulating in wildlife that aren't causing any problem for the wildlife to spill over and infect pe people. I mean, you wrote a whole book about it. And I think it's it's figuring out how to allow wildlife to thrive in their natural environments without that contact with people that allows the spillover events to happen is really, really critical. And it's, you know, again, uh, it's, it's why we've been practicing, you know, many of the same preventative measures we're practicing right now for COVID in, in our towns, our cities, our countries, are some of the measures we've been practicing for a long time at not just mountain gorilla sites, but other great ape sites around the world, just because that close genetic relatedness between people and, and great apes means that there's always the threat for even a normal virus that we carry all the time, like influenza or any of the other viruses that cause give us a common cold, those viruses could get into great apes. And so those, you know, just social distancing, hygiene, you know, pre uh, preventive measures, mask use are all really, really important for wildlife conservation. Um, mm -hmm. And again, it's really been what I think right now has really kept that virus out of um, the mountain gorilla population. And they're unique because so many of them allow people to come really, really close. So, um, so they really are, um, they really are at risk. But we've uh, so far so good. Again, not wood. Yeah, yeah. We're going to go to audience questions soon. But uh, I have at least one other that I think uh, uh, I'd like to hear you all on. Um, this is a huge challenge to bat conservation. The more we hear about bats as reservoir hosts for these viruses, the more the general public hears about that, the more challenge to bat conservation. And some people are making the obvious leap, well, if bats carry these viruses, then we should get rid of bats. How do we address that? How do we head off this, this possibly horrible setback in terms of bat conservation. I'll, I'll just take the first stab and then turn it over to John and Mary, but um, you're absolutely right. It's, as wildlife conservationists, it's one of our biggest fears. Um, again, but, you know, back to the fact that bats are incredibly important for us um, and, and our livelihoods and our well-being on the planet. And so um, the absolute last thing we should be doing is exterminating them. And in fact, there's a lot of science to show that that doesn't work at all for reducing populations of bats. As soon as they're exterminated from an area, the bats come in. And in fact, new bats, new susceptibles help keep these viruses at very high levels in the bat population. So it's absolutely the wrong thing to do, even from a human health standpoint. So, um, so it's really important to be conveying messages about how people should be living can be living safely with bats. And we do a lot of that in our work is to just try to enforce mm -hmm. you know, best practices uh, around um, co cohabitating with wildlife and having wildlife in our environment, minimizing that contact, but give it to Mary or John. Um, yeah, I mean, I would just echo everything that Kirsten has said. I think um, any, any sort of initiative to try and address that needs to happen very quickly. So public awareness, education needs to start kicking in now and I, I, it needs political will behind it. Um, it needs to have the support of governments and spokespeople who are prepared to stand up and speak out. Um, and John, you may have something else to add to that. Yeah, so Wild Ed's already uh, launched several uh, campaigns, uh, both in China and Vietnam, to address this, focusing primarily on pangolins. We happen to have materials ready to go. So we have, uh, I think, just in the last two weeks, 200 new billboards in several key cities around southern China. And again, our messaging is very positive, where we're not trying to scare people or make everyone go out and kill every last pangolin and every last bat because they're you know going to put their community at risk i think the bigger issue is really focusing on the overall trade and the existence of the trade and the demand that that uh drives the the trade which is really uh creating the risk and i do believe uh that people are starting to understand the connection more and more at least in china and and Vietnam between the bats and uh, nature and human health. So a big message here is also protecting habitats and, and um, reducing our impact and what um, has been mentioned around deforestation and those types of impacts as well. Thanks, John. I think we've got uh, time for one more if I stated concisely and maybe you all answer concisely. Um, 
I saw news from ProMedMail this morning that at the Bronx Zoo, uh, there are four tigers and three lions who have now additionally tested positive for the, for the coronavirus. Uh, and John Goodrich there, uh, who we probably all know, great tiger biologist, John Goodrich, uh, saying that this is potentially, if, uh, if it causes serious disease in, in cats of all sorts, felids of all sorts, this could potentially be a severe conservation concern for uh, big cats in the wild. We don't have any evidence yet that it is a severe uh, disease in cats, but um, anybody have thoughts on that? I can comment quickly on that. You know, part of, um, again, as we learn more about this virus um, and what it does in other hosts, um, part of it's really about that biology between the virus and how it enters the cell of, of, of an animal that's infected. And it turns out that the receptor on the cells, on our cells that allows that virus to get into the cells is quite similar to the re same receptor in the felids, not as similar as, as in um, canids, as in dogs. So um, similar, it is similar to um, ferrets. So potentially mustelids are a concern. So the, again, these are the kinds of things as we do more and more science, we're going to realize that there are other potentially susceptible taxa other than just humans. Um, but the same measures for preventing transmission will apply no matter whether we're talking about human and, and contact. I mean, we're seeing the virus is, it is there are cases where people who are very, very sick and shedding a lot of virus are infecting their pet cats. And yeah, some of those yeah. cats are getting sick. So, um, yeah. so again, uh, as we learn more, but it's um, the point is, is well taken that this, this could present, present a conservation challenge, um, not just for great apes yeah. in the wild, but other animals. Thank you, Kirsten. Okay, Paul, do we have a question or two from the audience yeah, you want to bring in? We've got just a few minutes remaining, so I wanted to get a question in from the audience. Uh, here's one from Aaron, and David, I'm going to direct this one to you. So a lot of people at home listening um, from the safety of their home want to know how they can help prevent the next pandemic. Sort of what are some practical things that they can do um, in this day and age to stay informed and to, to help out? Well, stay informed. That's the first big one. Educate yourself on this problem um, and uh, and let yourself remember that um, it's not just people in China who fancy wild flavor, uh, people in Africa who are eating uh, what we call bushmeat. When we, eat, when we eat wild animals in Montana here, we call it game. Um, these are These are subjective and invidious distinctions. And there is enough responsibility for this overall problem to go around to all of us. Every decision we make about what we eat, what we wear, how much we consume, how much we travel, um, how many children we have, if we choose to have children, all of those decisions put pressure on wild ecosystems and bring the viruses in wild animals closer to us. So I think that um, change begins at home in terms of diet, in terms of uh, reproduction, in terms of all those decisions that we make. Great, any other? Points from the others? No, I think I think that summed up very well. So I have nothing to add to that. Okay, great. So then perhaps stemming from that, John, I'll ask you a question. This one um, comes from Caroline, who is asking sort of how feasible is it and how realistic do you think it is for, um, for people around the world to change the habits and to do so in time to prevent species extinction and to prevent the next spillover. I know you do a lot of work in Asia. So in terms of that behavior change, how, how realistic is it? I would say uh, this is the opportunity, uh, despite the devastating impact of this pandemic, this is our opportunity right now when everyone is focused on how dangerous uh, the wildlife trade can be both to the economy and to our societies and our public health. So now is our real, really our opportunity to connect these issues and places like China or other countries, they're very much living with this. And I think they're, they're on their way. We, hopefully this uh, international kind of political sort of debate can be quelled and we can move on to uh, addressing the issue without distortion and distraction, which is what is gonna be needed. But uh, as the impact of this uh, pandemic uh, reaches beyond the audience of people who are already concerned about wildlife conservation and economic uh, and environmental uh, conservation, 
this is really our chance. So I believe it's very hopeful and positive and uh, we're working very hard to push this forward. And, um, you know, I think, again, we really want this to be a truly a global response where all the different countries, we've heard a lot of different countries already mentioned, everyone needs to step up and play a role. And it's not just going to be only China that's going to solve this. Great. Thank you. Now, unfortunately, with that, we are out of time. So I just want to thank you all. Thank the panelists, David, Mary, Kirsten, John, you guys have been terrific. Thank you, everybody at home for tuning in. Um, we at WCN, we're, thank you. we're so thankful for everybody's support. We love our community so much, and we are here if you need us, so please reach out. And if you're at home and you would like to learn more about these issues that we've been discussing today, please visit pangolincrisisfund.org, which is a, an initiative by WCN and its partner, Save Pangolins, and we have a lot of news about COVID and the wildlife trade. Um, and you can you can provide some support there as well. Now, please stick around. We're going to head into sessions. So if you'd like to join us for some live Q&As with other conservation partners, head to the sessions area on the side of your screen by clicking that button. OK, once again, thank you all the panelists. Thanks so much. And everybody be safe. Be safe. Thank you. Cheers. Stay safe. Stay engaged. Healthy.